Hello. God bless you. We are uh, back together again. Thank you for joining us for our online services. We are continuing in our series, The Hope of Glory, Christ in You. Uh, this week we are doing uh, part three, Christ in You, through the Word. And uh, I always just get started with some main text uh, and then kind of intro the idea of the morning or the, the day, and then we get into it together. So let's do that. Um, we've been starting in Colossians chapter 1, which is the kind of the anchor text for our series. Uh, uh, to them, God has chosen to make known among the Gentiles the glorious riches of this mystery, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim. All right, and then Colossians 3.11, another fantastic one that, that we've been, really been talking about. Uh, here there is no Gentile or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. I love that. I love those two verses. Uh, and then uh, just some more supporting verses for this idea that we're talking about, Christ in us, uh, the hope of glory. Uh, a couple more passages, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, verses 1 through 5. we kind of been looking at verse 2. I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and Him crucified. Uh, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 17 through 25. Um, God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. But we preach Christ crucified, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. All right, uh, uh, so uh, I was just, you know, we've, we just finished Philippians. Uh, uh, I was looking at Colossians and praying that God would lead us uh, uh, to a verse, uh, lead me to a verse to preach on. Uh, I was just, you know, 27 verses into chapter 1, and my eyes fell on uh, those verses 27 and 28. And I just love those three phrases uh, uh, that we find in there. The glorious riches of this mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory. He is the one we proclaim. All right, so the goal uh, of this series is to set the Lord Jesus Christ before our eyes uh, uh, until he just fills our vision and we see nothing else besides Jesus in all of his glory, right? I know that's a high bar to set. Uh, I know that I've personally got a long ways to go before I get there, but I believe the Holy Spirit can help us uh, get to that place uh, uh, where Christ is all, right? Uh, uh, here's what I, I, I was, uh, uh, I thought about a passage of scripture and I decided this is not the way that I want to live my life, right? Uh, uh, it is, uh, it, Herod has an encounter with Jesus. Uh, uh, and what I decided is I don't want my relationship with Jesus. Uh, uh, I don't want Jesus just to be a curiosity in my life. Uh, all right, so Herod has this encounter with Jesus in Luke chapter 23. When Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him, right? I mean, when you first read that, uh, that passage and get into that little short verse there, uh, Luke 23 verses, sorry, Luke chapter 23 verses 8 through 12. Uh, when you first read about Herod, you think, oh, wow, maybe there's a chance uh, that, that his life's going to be changed by Jesus. Uh, you know, he, he wanted to see Jesus. He was greatly pleased. Uh, and, but then when you read on, you find out that that's not at all where, where Herod was going. His heart wasn't in the right place, right? Uh, from what he had heard about Jesus, Herod hoped to see him perform a sign of some sort, right? So to Herod, Jesus was just a curiosity. Uh, it says that Herod plied Jesus with many questions, but Jesus gave him no answer. The chief priests and the teachers of the law were standing there uh, accusing Jesus, uh, and Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked him, dressed him in an elegant robe. They sent him back to Pilate. Uh, uh, and so, you know, I read that passage of scripture and I decided I don't want Jesus just to be a curiosity in my life, right? Uh, when Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased uh, uh, because he had been wanting to see him for a long time. Uh, and but then just a few verses later, Herod and his soldiers ridiculed and mocked at Jesus, right? Uh, 
Herod wanted to see Jesus. So why did he want to do that, right? The, I, I think, isn't that the weirdest thing that Herod wanted to see Jesus? From what, and here's why Herod wanted to see Jesus. From what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some sort of miraculous sign, right? The, uh, I, I remember as a child going to the big Fresno fair with my mom. Uh, and like any other kid, I love going to the fair, right? To, uh, I love going to the fair to eat a corn dog. Uh, I love going to the fair uh, to ride the rides, right? I remember going on the zipper and going on Gravitron and rides that I can't even ride anymore. Um, uh, and, and so, and, and when I was a kid, there was a, a also another form of entertainment at the fair. Uh, they had the, those carnival attractions, right? And I'm not sure if they can even do them anymore, or if they do, it's a, I'm sure it's not politically correct. Uh, 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 but you'd be walking down, and you, there'd be the tents, and they'd have, they'd have their signs. Like I remember uh, one always advertising the world's largest raft, right? Uh, uh, and of course, uh, I always thought to myself, man, that's awesome, right? They've got the world's largest rat mom let's go in and see the world's largest rat and of course my mom would never pay to see the world's largest rat i don't know why she would deprive me of that meaningful possibly life-changing experience uh, you know what did my mom know about what was going on that, that i didn't know about what was going on right she knew that uh that 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 was a ripoff right uh, uh, you know, step right up uh, and witness uh, uh, this hideous mutant, the amazing, the incredible four-foot man-eating chicken. And you pay your money to get into the tent, uh, uh, but when you get into the tent, you don't find what you're expecting to find, a four-foot man-eating chicken. Uh, instead, what you find is a four-foot tall man uh, eating fried chicken, right? Uh, uh, when Herod saw Jesus, he was greatly pleased because for a long time he had been wanting to see him. Uh, from what he had heard about him, he hoped to see him perform some sort of sign or miracle, right? Herod didn't want to see Jesus because Herod wanted his life to be changed by Jesus. Herod wanted to see Jesus uh, because he wanted some sort of carnival experience in his life, right? Herod wanted Jesus to put on a show for him, uh, but Jesus refused to entertain Herod. Uh, Jesus did not put on a show for Herod, and Jesus is not going to put on a show for us. Uh, he doesn't want to be, and he will not abide being. Jesus refuses to be some sort of curiosity in our lives. Right? Have you ever heard an altar call where the pastor or the evangelist instructed people to come down to the altar and invite Jesus to come into a, a little corner of their hearts? I hope that you've never heard an altar call like that, right? Could you imagine? Right? Could you imagine the preacher just gets done preaching a white hot sermon and the power from heaven and the fire of God falls on the congregation uh, and he's going to close the service down by asking people to come down to the altars uh, to make uh, Jesus their savior. Uh, and, and he invites them down and he begins by saying, uh, now everyone that would like a little bit of Jesus in their lives uh, to help them when times are hard, uh, I want you to repeat after me. Uh, and he leads the people any any in prayer, and he asks them to repeat after him. It says, Jesus, right? Not King Jesus, not Lord Jesus, uh, but just good old, friendly, helpful Jesus. Uh, come into my heart. Uh, not all of my heart, uh, right? I, I can't give you that much room right now. I can't give you the whole thing, but I do have a little corner of my heart uh, that is reserved uh, just for you. Uh, and so please come into that corner of my heart uh, and every now and then, when I need a miracle in my life, right? Uh, when I need healing in my body, when I need some money that I don't have, uh, when my family needs a miracle or, or there's something going on, uh, every now and then, come and help me when I need you. But I don't need you around all of the time, you know, dictating all of my life, ruling over all of my decisions. But I do need you sometimes. 
uh, when life gets hard. So come into this little corner of my heart. Could you imagine an altar call where the pastor or evangelist uh, uh, ends the service by saying that? I, I, I hope uh, that we never experience that, right? Uh, I hope that we never live our lives. Or more importantly, I hope we never live our lives uh, like that altar call uh, where we just want Jesus to be a little part when we need him. And, and the goal of this series, the hope of glory, Christ in you, it, it, the goal is to set the Lord Jesus Christ before our eyes until he fills our vision and we see nothing else besides him and his glory. Uh, we didn't invite Jesus into the corner of our hearts when we got saved. When we got saved, we said, here I am, Lord. I surrender my life to you. I give you my heart. Change me. Transform me. Right? Uh, I, here there is no Jew or Gentile, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ is all and is in all. God's love for us is exceedingly great. I want to read it to you uh, from a, a book by D.L. Moody. It's a, a, his life story. It's a collection of his writings. Uh, and he, he wrote something in there I want to read to you. Uh, it, it says that uh, D.L. Moody visited Dublin, Dublin Ireland, uh, where he met Harry Morehouse, uh, who was nicknamed the Boy Preacher, uh, and introduced himself uh, and said that he would like to come to Chicago uh, to Mr. Moody's church uh, and he would like to preach there. Uh, and, it, and it says uh, uh, that D.L. Moody looked at this young preacher, he looked at him, uh, he was a beardless boy, he didn't look as if he was more than 17, and D.L. Moody said in his side of himself, he said, this kid can't preach. Uh, he, he wanted me to let him know what boat I was going on back to America as he would like to return with me. Uh, and I thought to myself, he can't preach it. And so I didn't tell him which boat I was going on. Uh, but I'd not been in Chicago a great many weeks before I got a letter uh, which said that he had arrived in this country and that he would come to Chicago and preach for me if I wanted him to. And so I sat down uh, and I wrote a very cold letter to the young preacher, Harry Morehouse. Uh, uh, and I simply said, if you come west, call on me. Uh, I thought that would be the last that I should hear from him. Uh, but soon I got another letter saying that he was still coming to this country uh, and he would come to my church and preach for me if I wanted to, if I wanted to. And so I wrote to him again, telling to him that if he happened to come west to drop on me. And in the course of a few days, I got another letter stating that next Thursday he would be in Chicago and he would come and preach for me if I wanted him to. Uh, and I didn't know what to do with him. Right? I had made up in my mind that he couldn't preach. I was going to be out of town Thursday and Friday. Uh, and so I just told the officers of my church, there's a young man coming here Thursday and Friday and he wants to preach. And I don't know if he can preach or not. I don't think that he can. But I guess you better go ahead and give him a try. Uh, and, and I'll be back on Saturday to see how things are going. And when I got back on Saturday morning, I was anxious to know how the young man was getting along. The first thing I said to my wife when I got into the house was, uh, how's that young Englishman coming along? Uh, how do the people like him? And my wife said that they liked him very much. Uh, and I asked her, did you hear him? And she said, yes, that she did. And I asked, do you like him? And she said, yes, I liked him very much. He's preached two sermons from John chapter 3, verse 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And I think that you'll like him, although he preaches a little different than you do. Uh, and I said, how is that? And my wife said, well, he tells sinners that God loves them. And I said, well, he's wrong. Right? Can you imagine that, uh, D.L. Moody? Uh, she said, I think you'll agree with him after you hear him preach, because he backs up everything he preaches from the Word of God. Uh, she said, you think if a man doesn't preach like you do, that he's wrong. 
Uh, I went down that night to church and I noticed that everyone had brought their Bibles to the service. Uh, uh, and and uh, that young Harry Morehouse, he began to preach and he said, my friends, if you'll turn to the third chapter of John and the 16th verse, you'll find my text. Uh, he preached a most extraordinary sermon from that verse. Uh, he didn't divide the text into firstly and secondly and thirdly. Uh, he just took it as a whole and he went through the Bible from Genesis to Revelation to prove that through all the ages, God has loved the world uh, that he sent prophets and patriarchs and holy men to warn us. And last of all, that he sent his son. And after they murdered him, he sent his Holy Spirit. Uh, I never knew up to that time that God loved us so much. Uh, this heart of mine began to thaw out uh, and I could not keep back the tears. It was like news from a far country and I just drank it in. Uh, the next night there was a great crowd for the people liked it to hear that God loves them. Uh, and that the preacher said, my friends, if you'll turn in your Bibles to the third chapter of John and the 16th verse, you'll find my text. Uh, and he preached another extraordinary sermon from that wonderful verse. Uh, and he went on proving God's love uh, again from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, he could turn to almost any part of the Bible and prove it. Uh, I thought that that sermon was better than the last sermon, that he struck a higher chord than ever, uh, and it was sweet for my soul to hear it. Uh, the next night he said again, my friend, if you'll turn to the 16th verse of the third chapter of John, you'll find my text. Uh, and again, he followed it out to prove that God loves us. Uh, he just beat it down into our hearts, uh, and I've never doubted it ever since. I used to preach that God was behind the sinner uh, with a double-edged sword uh, ready to cut them down. Uh, I have got done with that kind of preaching. Now I preach uh, that God is behind the sinner with love, uh, and the sinner is running away from the God of love. Uh, Tuesday night came, and, and we thought that surely he had exhausted the text. Uh, and that he would take another. Uh, but he preached the sixth sermon from that wonderful text. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him should not perish. But have. Not going to have when they die. But have right now everlasting life. Uh, although many years have rolled away. His hearers uh, have never forgotten his words. The seventh night came. Uh, and he went into the pulpit, and every eye was fixed upon him. All were anxious to know what he was going to preach about. He said, my friends, I've been hunting all day for a new text, but I cannot find one as good as the old one. So we will go back to the third chapter of John and the 16th verse, and he preached a seventh sermon from that wonderful text. And I remember him closing the sermon, and he said, my friends, for a whole week, I've been trying to tell you how much God loves you, but I cannot do it with this poor stammering tongue. If I could borrow Jacob's ladder and climb up into the heavens, and if I could ask Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Almighty, if he could tell me how much love the Father has for the world, Gabriel would answer me with these words. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Uh, I absolutely love, uh, I love that, right? God's love for us is great. Uh, I've said it, said before that it is, is so great uh, that it can't be measured, right? Uh, and and I, I was just thinking, you know, that's only partly true. There is an indicator. The only problem is uh, uh, there's not a scale on earth uh, that has ever been built that can carry the weight uh, uh, of the measurement of God's love for us. Uh, how do we just begin to measure God's love for us? Uh, we can attempt it uh, by looking at what he was willing to give uh, to save us. For God so loved the world uh, that he gave his one and only son uh, that whoever believes in him shall not perish uh, 
but have everlasting life. He gave his best, right? He gave his uttermost. He gave to the depths. He withheld nothing because there was nothing that could cost him as dearly. There's nothing that could cost him more. We can only begin to fathom the depth of his love for us in the knowledge of what he gave to make us his own, to adopt us into his family, right? Uh, how can we, we repay the one who paid all for us? How can we repay the father for the gift of his son? Uh, and, and I'll start by stating the obvious, just in case, right? Uh, uh, we can never repay or pay for our salvation. I, I understand that theologically. You know, I know, uh, we know that uh, it's by grace that we've been saved through faith. Uh, and it's not from ourselves. It's the gift of God, not by works. So that no one can boast. Uh, and so we can never repay. I'm not talking about works. I'm not talking about trying to earn our salvation uh, by doing a bunch of good things. But what I am talking about is this that God loved me, uh, and that God loves me so much uh, that I want to love him as much as he loves me, right? Jesus loves me so much uh, that he was willing to give his life for me, and because of that, I want to love Jesus so much uh, uh, that I am willing to give up my life uh, for him. Uh, that is the point of this sermon series, The Hope of Glory, Christ in you. Uh, it is to take us from the place where we are, maybe struggling uh, with a little selfishness, uh, with a little self-centeredness, uh, with a little me-ism, right? With a little uh, I focus on our lives uh, and to take our hearts, uh, our selfish hearts, and to transform us uh, uh, and to turn us around from that place uh, so that we get pointed in the right direction where Christ is all. He becomes the focus. Uh, he fills our vision. We want to get to that place uh, where we recognize that the Father and the Son have loved us so greatly, so fully, uh, that the desire of our hearts are changed and transformed so that our love for them would be as great and as full as it possibly can be because they've loved us so much. We want to love them so much. Let's pray for that because I believe uh, that God has to help us get there. We can't get there on, their own, on our own. God, uh, by his grace, has to help us get there. Let's pray for it together. Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you for your people. Lord, I believe that we are similar in our desires, that we want our lives to be changed because our lives have been changed by Jesus. We ask for the grace that we could surrender totally and completely, that we would be able to give up our lives and say, here we are, Lord, uh, take us uh, uh, just as we are and make us the way you want us to be. May you become all to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. If you are following along or you'd like to follow along with the notes, uh, the link uh, is in uh, the description under the video. And you can have all the main points and all the verses if you want to do some studying and looking at the word. Um, point number one, the hope of glory and the simplicity of knowing the truth, right? Uh, this is our our third sermon and uh, the uh, the focus of this one is Christ in us through the word. All right, we've talked a little about simplicity already during the series and I wanted to hit on that idea again, right? The hope of glory and the simplicity of knowing the truth. In the beginning was the word, the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him Jesus was life. And that life was the light of all mankind. Uh, verse 14. The word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory. The glory of the one and only son. Who came from the father. Full of grace and truth. Right? Uh, so... I hate to say this this way, but it's true. I am a religious leader. Uh, and one thing that religious leaders have a tendency to do 
is they have a tendency to overcomplicate things, right? You could read Matthew chapter 23 uh, and find that Jesus pronouncing, uh, I believe it's the seven woes, right, on, on the scribes and Pharisees and the religious leaders of his time because uh, those religious leaders, they just made everything so hard and so complicated. Uh, they they uh, made it so difficult for people to come into relationship with the Father that Jesus said they actually, here they were, the, the religious leaders of the people, but Jesus said they kept people from finding God. Uh, Jesus said to the crowds and to the disciples, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat to so you must be careful to do everything they tell you. But do not do what they do, for they do not practice what they preach. They tie up heavy, cumbersome loads and put them on other people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to lift a finger to help them. He says, Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter. Uh, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert, and when you have succeeded, you make them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Uh, to which I say, yikes, right? Uh, that is not what I want to do with my preaching, and hopefully this series isn't doing uh, what Jesus just said right there, right? The last thing I want to do is make loving God a burden uh, that is too heavy for us to carry. And so I wanted to circle back to a simple truth uh, that is a powerful truth that can help us find our way back to loving Jesus with all of our hearts, right? Uh, if we want the hope of glory, which is Christ in us, uh, we can obtain that by reigniting our passion for God's word, right? If we want to fall in love with Jesus, uh, uh, that is a love affair that is easy to start. Uh, uh, and it just starts by falling in love with the word of God. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life uh, and that life was the light of all mankind, right? Jesus. Uh, John chapter 8. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free, right? Uh, the word. The word was with God, and the word was God. The word is the truth, and the truth will set us free, right? Jesus is the word. Jesus is the truth. Jesus sets us free. Do we want to be free from the love affair that we have, the world and all of its distractions? Loving Jesus will set us free from, from all of those trappings, right? And the more that we dive into the word of God, the more we're diving into our relationship with the Son of God. Uh, because the Word of God and the Son of God are inseparable partners with one another, right? Uh, when we know the Word, then we know the truth. Uh, and there has to be an emphasis uh, on the knowing, right? Uh, uh, Christian living is based on our knowledge of the truth. We've got to know the truth. Uh, to love the truth, uh, you've got to know what the truth is. Uh, you know, for a long time, uh, I have heard people misquote John chapter 8, verse 32. I, I always hear people say uh, that the truth will set you free, right? But that's not what the verse says. The, the verse doesn't just say the truth will set you free. This, the scripture doesn't just say that. Uh, what the scripture does say is that Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in the word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. All right, so let's, uh, let's start by looking at the phrase, if you abide in my word, and ask ourselves the question, are we abiding in the word, right? Uh, are, we, are we abiding in the word? Have we made his word our life, 
Uh, I'm not asking you, do you read the verse of the day uh, every day, right? Everyone's got the U version app, uh, uh, the Bible app, and it's got the verse of the day, and you've got your, uh, your uh, Bible verse streak number, right? Maybe you've been uh, reading it, you know, maybe you're on uh, in the 400s or 500s or whatever you're on. Uh, I, I'm not asking you, do you read the verse of the day every day? Not, I mean, that's a great thing. Read the verse every day. Uh, uh, but I wouldn't exactly call that abiding in his word, right? Uh, uh, I mean, one verse can be enough. It just depends on what you're doing, right? You can, if you're grabbing a verse uh, and you're looking at it from every single direction and turning it every which way, uh, and you're searching out the cross references and you're looking at it uh, in the Strongs uh, uh, and you're looking at passages that relate to that same idea uh, and you're writing down in your journal and putting down your thoughts uh, and then you're praying over it and asking God uh, to reveal truth to you in it. Uh, all right, uh, uh, you can abide in the word through one verse. You can certainly do that. Uh, uh, but just opening up your phone uh, and quickly reading over the verse of the day to boost your streak number, that isn't exactly abiding in his word, right? Uh, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You abide in it, you live in it, and you know it. Uh, and when we treat God's word that way, the freedom that Jesus spoke about comes to our lives, okay? Um, point number two. Uh, the hope of glory and the precious word of God. Okay, the hope of glory and the precious word of God. So, so the word of God is precious. It's First Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1 in the King James Version. Uh, and the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious. In those days there was no open vision. I want the word of the Lord to be precious in my life. Uh, uh, and if you're watching this, uh, uh, I believe you want the same thing, right? We need to pray for a revival of the preciousness of God's word uh, in our own hearts and in our nations, that the word of God would become precious to us and would become precious to America again. Uh, the word is precious because of its penetrating power. All right, when our hearts are hard, as they often are, God uses his word to break through to us, right? Uh, the word of God is alive and active. It, it is sharper than any double-edged sword. It, it penetrates it. Even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, it judges the thoughts and an attitudes of our hearts. Uh, the word is precious because it has penetrating power. It breaks through uh, the stony heart, right? God uses his word to get through to us. I still vividly remember uh, uh, almost 30 years ago, 30? Uh, anyway, so uh, I was 18 years old. I was sitting in a college cafeteria on the Fresno City College campus, uh, uh, and I was sitting at a table with some of my friends, and, uh, and of course I, I, I was not born again at that time. I grew up going to church. I knew all about God's plan of salvation. I knew that Jesus was the Savior. Uh, I believed that Jesus was the Savior, but I wasn't personally born again. Uh, and I was sitting on that college campus in that cafeteria at that table with my friends and we were all running our mouths off. And, uh, and like any group of 18 year old boys, uh, uh, we had foul mouths and, uh, and we were engaged in foul conversation. Uh, and there happened to be on my campus at that time, a Messianic Jew. Uh, he was part of the Jews for Jesus, uh, and it just so happened that he was in that cafeteria, and he was seated at that very table, uh, and he could hear every single word uh, that we were saying to one another. And at some point in the middle of our conversation, uh, he had had enough of the garbage that was coming out of our mouths. And, and, and you know, of course, I believe it was the Holy Spirit that, uh, but he singled me out and he looked right at me. He looked right into my eyes 
uh, and he took his hand and he pointed his finger and he pointed it right in my face uh, uh, and he said these words to me. He said, are you a Christian? Uh, and he said, if you are lukewarm, he will spew you out of his mouth. Uh, and he picked up his tray and he marched all away from that table. Uh, and I will never forget that incident. Uh, and I will never forget those words uh, uh, because God used his word that day to penetrate my heart uh, and to cut me right down to the bone. I'll never forget it. The word is precious because it penetrates, uh, uh, and that uh, those words changed my life, uh, right? Uh, uh, the word is precious because of its purifying work that it does in our lives. Uh, the word has power to purify our lives. Jeremiah 23, is not my word like fire, declares the Lord, like a hammer, it breaks the rock in pieces, the fire of God's word is God's agent of purification, and he uses it to purify our lives. Proverbs 25 says, Remove the dross from the silver, and then a silversmith can produce a vessel from it. Okay? And fire is what they use to remove the dross from the silver, right? A smith or a finer. Uh, that, that's the person, the, the man or woman, the, the person that works uh, with the precious metals. Uh, they have the raw materials uh, uh, and, and all of that, uh, and inside of it, the precious metals. Uh, and they take those things and they put them in what they call a smelting pot. Uh, and then they take that pot and they put it in a furnace uh, and they turn up that furnace to uh, 2,000 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, uh, and, and they just begin to melt that. Uh, and, and when they do that, the fire causes the impurities in the smelting pot to rise to the surface. Uh, and after the impurities rise to the surface, then the finer or the smith, uh, they take a tool and they scrape off the impurities so that when they're done with that process, all they're left with is the pure gold or the pure silver uh, so they have a, a, a pure material that they can work with, right? First Peter chapter 1. In this you greatly rejoice, uh, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer grief uh, in all kinds of trials. Uh, these have come so that the proven genuineness of your faith, uh, of greater worth than gold which perishes, even though refined by fire, may result in praise and glory and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Heat makes the impurities rise to the surface uh, uh, and then they can be dealt with, they can be skimmed off. Uh, uh, we can recognize them and see them. We can repent of them and ask Jesus to help us, uh, uh, to take them from us. Uh, just uh, uh, the, the fire does for us, <laughs> right? Uh, the fire causes the impurities to rise to the top uh, so that they can be dealt with. Um, the Word of God is a purifying agent. Everyone can do the right thing when it's easy, right? Uh, God wants to give us, to instill in us uh, the strength of character so that we do the right thing when it's hard. Uh, God finds a way to turn up the heat in our lives, uh, not so he can destroy our lives, uh, uh, but so that he can make us better, so that he can make us stronger. He doesn't turn up the heat um, so that, that uh, he can destroy us, but he turns up the heat so he can skim away the things that don't look like his son from our lives, right? Uh, and we have to decide when those moments and seasons come in our lives when the heat is turned up uh, and we see the impurities rise to the surface, uh, we have to decide how we're going to respond to that. Uh, and we need to pray in advance that we can have the grace and strength to be like Jesus in those moments and pray like Jesus prayed. Father, if you're willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. In other words, Father, 
Uh, if I didn't have to, I wouldn't want to go through what it is I'm about to face. It. But you know what, Father? What I want for my life is what you want for my life. That is an amazing, mature, bold prayer that Jesus prayed. And we need to ask God for grace so that when the fire and the heat comes in, the purifying agent of God's word uh, comes in, that we can respond like Jesus responded. And we can pray like Jesus prayed, right? God my flesh wants what my flesh wants. Uh, but God, what I'm saying and praying right now is, uh, I don't want what my flesh wants. Uh, I want what you want for me. And let the purifying agent of your word change my heart. Uh, all right. And finally, uh, number three, our conclusion. The hope of glory and the life-giving word of God. All right. The hope of glory and the life-giving word of God. Oh, excuse me. Um, what I loved about the Bible when I was 19 years old and a brand new follower of Jesus is what I still love about the Bible after reading it for the last 29 years. There's no other book in the world that can do for you what reading the Bible can do for you. Because there's no other book in the world that can make the same claim that the Bible makes. For the Word of God is alive and active. <clears throat> no other book, right? No other book can make that claim that it is a living, written letter directly to our hearts. Uh, the Word of God is alive. Jesus is the Word of God. Jesus is alive. The Word of God is alive, and Jesus said, Because I live, you also will live. Right? The Word gives us life. Psalms 119, My soul clings to the dust. Give me life according to your Word. The Word is life. Why did Jesus come? It's a rhetorical question, right? The, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come so that they might have a life and they might have a life to the full, abundant life. The Son came to give us full and abundant life. Uh, the Father gives us the Son uh, so that He can give us what? The Father gives us the Son so He can give us life. My Father who gives you the true bread from heaven, I am the bread of life. That's what Jesus said, that the Son is the bread of life. Uh, I hope uh, that, that the hope of glory, Christ in us, uh, we are truly alive because of Jesus and His Word. In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. Life, the Son of God, and the Word of God, they cannot be disconnected from one another. If you are not alive today, if you're watching right now uh, and you're saying within yourself, uh, I don't feel alive, I, I don't, I haven't experienced uh, what you're talking about. Uh, uh, I know about this man named Jesus, uh, but I don't know what it is, that, this abundant life that you're talking about. You can be alive. That is the will of God for you. Jesus wants to do that for us, right? If you are watching today and you feel uh, like you are on spiritual life support, there is hope and his name is Jesus. Uh, the Son of God has a spiritual defibrillator and it is the word of God all right you might be saying pastor uh, I'm just not sure uh, I've struggled so much uh, I just feel like maybe I'm too far gone uh, maybe there's just no hope for someone like me in my situation uh, that has lived a life like I've lived uh, I just don't think that God can give me life uh, 
Uh, I just don't know if it's possible. To which I say uh, it is possible and there is always hope uh, because of the hope of glory, Christ in you. You are not too far gone. No one is ever too far gone. The word of God can bring life to you and make you live. All right, in John chapter 11, Jesus heard that his friend Lazarus was sick, and so he went to have a visit with him. Uh, but when Jesus got to the home of Mary and Martha and Lazarus, uh, uh, Mary and Martha explained to Jesus that Lazarus was already dead, uh, that he'd been in the tomb for four days already, that by now he stinketh. Uh, but Jesus had uh, the defibrillator of heaven at the ready. Uh, he said to his sisters, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live even though they die. And whoever lives, uh, uh, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. Do you believe this? And that's the question, right? That is the question for us, church. Uh, do we believe what Jesus said? Do we believe this? That day, uh, Jesus did not hold a funeral for Lazarus. That day, Jesus held a funeral for death. Death was defeated uh, because the resurrection and the life was standing outside of the tomb of a man who was dead, but who could not remain dead after the words from the mouth of Jesus commanded him to be alive. Jesus said it, uh, Lazarus had to obey it. Uh, Jesus stood outside the tomb with his paddles, right? Uh, uh, buzzing with the power of God. And he said, clear, uh, and he shouted, Lazarus, come forth. Uh, and the man that was dead, became a man that was alive because the word of God is the resurrection and the life. Uh, and that same Jesus uh, that stood outside of the tomb of Lazarus uh, and said, Lazarus, come forth, uh, is the same Jesus uh, uh, that is standing outside of our heart's doors right now, right? Uh, uh, that same Jesus uh, uh, is seated at the right hand of the Father and is praying and is interceding for us. And if we want him to, if we say inside of our hearts uh, that we want to be alive, Jesus will take those same spiritual defibrillators, the word of God, uh, and, and he will say, like he said, Lazarus, come forth. Uh, uh, he'll speak those words over our lives. And when he does, we will become alive. Uh, that's what I want. Uh, and if you're watching, I believe that's probably what you want. Uh, we want the hope of glory, uh, Christ in us. We want Christ to become all. Uh, and because he lives, we want to live. Uh, we want Jesus to say to us, uh, come forth, live. Uh, and that is my prayer for you and for me and for the church uh, uh, that we would live and that we would glorify the name of Jesus, that we would see him uh, become everything and to fill our vision and our lives uh, so that he would receive the glory and honor that is due to his name. Uh, that's my prayer. Uh, and, and thank you for being with me this morning. I pray that you're blessed and encouraged uh, and I'll see you soon. Amen.